Evening Borough fans, welcome to Borough Fan TV and the third half with me, James Hutchinson. Tonight we are joined by a man who made over 350 appearances for the club in two spells during the 1970s and 80s. Captain sides containing players like David Armstrong, Craig Johnson, David Hodgson and Mark Proctor. Welcome to the show, Tony Trapper McAndrew. Thanks, James. You Good okay? To be here. Yeah. Uh, you described yourself as a naturally aggressive player, Tony. Do you think that was a fair description? I think that was a bit mild. I was probably <laughs> probably a thug, if I was being totally honest. <laughs> well, I'm sure the viewers will have loads of questions out there tonight for Tony. So send them in, and uh, we'll do our best to get through them. Tony, earliest memories or earliest footballing memories as a youngster? What were they? Yeah, as uh, as a young young boy, I used to follow Celtic in right. Glasgow. Yeah, uh, and watching people like Murdoch and uh, Harry Hood, Bobby Lennox, uh, run about the Lisbon Lions. So thing. right, yeah, yeah so it's, it was uh, it was a fantastic, fantastic team to, to watch. Yeah, and as a young lad, it must have been pretty inspirational seeing local lads being <clears throat> at the top of the game at the time, champions of Europe, stuff like that. It must have really filled you with a lot of inspiration thinking, yeah, I want to be a footballer well, as well. Half of the city of Glasgow was delighted with that uh, 67 uh, <laughs> Celtic team. The other half of Glasgow wasn't so happy. I can imagine. Uh, but yeah. to get that squad and that team living within 20 miles of Celtic Park, I don't, I don't think that'll ever be uh, equaled. Yeah, yeah. And then tell us about your own early days playing football um, <clears throat> and how a lad from Lanark ended up at the Borough. Yeah, I... Uh, I don't know where they get Lanark from. I'm from the Gorbals and and, and we're in uh, Glasgow. Uh, Lanark's a bit further away. Right. But I uh, I was playing for a, 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 a boys club called Easter Craigs. Right. Uh, and the game that, that I got asked to come down to middle run trial was we, we lost six 0 The scout was Jack McCartney. Right. Uh, but he obviously seen something that that nobody else saw. So I got invited down for a for a trial and. Had uh, two weeks down here, and right. uh, then got offered a scholarship or an apprenticeship, as it was then. Mm -hmm. uh, and after my parents had been down to have a look at me digs and stuff, I, I agreed to sign. Yeah, yeah. And you were like happy to come to the borough then. Yeah, I. I came here when I was fifteen, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just there's something about Middlesbrough. It, it's just I love the place. I always have done. Yeah, no special. That's great that. Um, so a few years playing in the junior. So can you think of any like your contemporaries or any other players that you played with at that time in the junior team or before? The, ju the junior team was uh, in Glasgow or at the borough. At uh, the borough. At the borough. Or oh, David Armstrong was the, uh, right. was the was the absolute star. Yeah. And was it apparent he was going to be oh, a top player? God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was different classes of youth player. Malcolm Smith, uh, Pat Cough, Brian Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just fantastic setup. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And you made your debut um, as part of Charlton's Champions team the 1973-74 uh, season and you deputised for Graham Souness in a 2-1 win over Luton. When you came into that squad, could you again sense that this was like a special team, a really good team to be a part of? Yeah, it was, I think it was halfway through the season. I know it was, it was, uh, it was pretty cold, so it must have been on the, on the dark days. Mm. So there'd been plenty of games and, and they were a really top class side yeah and to be anywhere near it i was i mean i was only 17 at the time mm -hmm. and it was uh it was huge for me yeah uh i just try to learn every day at, yeah. at training although i only played the one game i was in and about the the, uh, the squad training wise yeah uh and it, it was just i mean soonest and, and murdoch were just phenomenal the center backs boom and madden uh were, were just a great pairing, and John Craggs is probably the, the one of the finest players that I've, I've ever yeah, played with, yeah. and a, a tremendous player. Yeah. Do you know when you hear now sometimes when young players come into a team or into a squad, and they sometimes say some of the more established players take them under the wing when they first join the first team? Did that happen with you, Tony, or were you just like left to get on with it yourself, or did you get special instructions off Jack? And it was it was a little bit different. Uh, some of the older guys didn't really take to the younger players coming right. in, but people like like Graham and Phil Bosma and and, and Willie Madrin and 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 and, and Bomey, they they welcomed the young players because they start Jack had started introducing players like myself and and Billy Woof and mm -hmm. into the squad yeah. and uh, it was 
it was better when they did start to accept you because it was yeah. difficult to, to break into some of the senior lads' uh, habits and the way of doing things. Right. Just got a few questions coming. I've got one of you from Andrew Garbett. Interesting one, this. What modern player would Tony describe himself as these days? <laughs> uh, it certainly wouldn't be a Premier League player. It'd be, <laughs> it'd be somewhere in the, uh, the lower reaches of the, the football league. Someone who would look after himself, I think, is a uh, fair answer to that. Yeah. I, I don't think... Uh, it's like anything, you would have to adjust. Yeah. And, and if I was playing now, I would have to adjust how mm. I played. Or I wouldn't be playing, I'd be sat in the stand yeah, yeah. most of the time. So I would uh, I would have to adjust I, I, and I, I would hope I would be able to compete at a, at a reasonable level. Yeah, sure you would, Tony, yeah. Um, you spent some time playing in the North American Soccer League uh, with Vancouver Whitecaps. Some loan deal, that like Tony, yeah. get, a, get a shift over there in Vancouver. Um, some big names involved in that, Tony? Who did you play with, against, stuff like that? Who was there? Uh, the big, my biggest claim to fame is uh, I had to do a man-to-man -man job on George Best. Uh, I played for Vancouver. He played for Los Angeles Aztecs. Yeah. And uh, I was on a, a $100 bonus if he didn't score. And uh, that was that was pretty cool. Did you get it? I did. You did? Oh, well yeah. done. Excellent. <laughs> and then you came back. So how long was it you were out in Vancouver for? Oh, it was only... Uh, just under three months. Three it was months. for the close season. Right, okay. Um, so then you came back the following season, and I think towards the end of the 75, 76 season, you started to get a run in the team. Um, and then near the end of that season, you played against Sheffield United in a home game, and you scored a hat trick, top flight hat trick. Still on record as being the youngest player to play for the Borough to score a hat trick. Can you remember anything about that day? Must be able to remember loads about it, Tony. The, the, the day, not so much, but the week leading up, I think Jack had an idea where he, he, he wanted me to just plough through the middle. And when we had the ball in the attacking half to get between the two strikers, and when we didn't have the ball to get back and then split between our two centre-halves. Mm -hmm. So I spent most of the game just ploughing up and down the middle, which was OK. Yeah. Uh, but Murdoch put two great crosses in that just yeah. I couldn't... I couldn't miss. Yeah. Uh, but the, the third goal was 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 quite good. I, I managed to play a little one two in the halfway line and went through. Uh, but when I scored, I I just didn't know what to do. Mm. It was it was in front of the all gate end, and I just it was weird. Yeah. It, it was no sliding on your knees and stuff. <laughs> I think it was just a wave to the crowd. Yeah. But it was. But there was no TV then, no. so I don't know if it was a good hat Yeah, trick. right. We'll have to see if we can dig out any footage of that somewhere, if there's anything about it. Um, any special words of praise from Jack after the game for getting that trick? No. No, didn't think there no, would Jack be. No, Jack was a hard man. <laughs> I was just pleased not to get a ball up yeah, no, after good. the game. <laughs> um, so Jack's following season was his last season at the club, uh, and you became a regular at the club that year, 76, 77. And then John Neal took over. As managers, how did they compare, John and Jack? How did oh, they compare? It, it, it was chalk and cheese. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack was so volatile and demonstrative and he, he would lose his head. John was very calm yeah. and very, very quiet. Uh, two great managers, but totally different styles. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that was reflected maybe in the way the teams played or how they were set up? Or do you think it was quite a smooth transition from Jack's team into John's team or...? I think uh, John, if I'm being honest, John, John gave some of the, the the players a lot more freedom. Right. I think he, he made them believe that they had this freedom where they, if they wanted to go and express themselves and play. Because mm -hmm. I, I actually think that although Jack's team was fantastic and they were naturally brilliant, uh, Jack was always, there was always a, a, a structure there where right. it, it was a defensive structure and yeah, we would yeah. play on the break. Mm -hmm. I think John wanted his teams to be a little bit more flair based. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think he, that that team as well had some tremendous players mm -hmm. in it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know we've just mentioned some of the names of the players and, and they went on to big things, things like um, David Hodgson, Craig Johnson, both went on to Liverpool and their teams, what they had in the 80s, great Prop, success. Prop, 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 Prop yeah. yeah. Yeah, some great players. And, and Armstrong goes, and, yeah. and Graham goes. And if you keep that team together, yeah, who knows? Oh no. yeah. Who knows? Well, that's it. I mean, that's another thing there. Fans of that generation often look back at the era and they say we should have won a trophy. Um, I mean, there was four FA Cup quarter-final defeats in seven years. 
uh, and the League Cup semi-final with Manchester, Manchester City. City. Um, was there any of those particular games or years where you think as a player involved so you thought that's one that got away we should have won some at that year definitely the Wolves won uh, right god that was we would Tottenham lined up for the, the semi and, that's right. and, and we we turned them over quite comfortably that year yeah. and we were quite confident of that but we just didn't we just didn't do the job at, at, the, at Molyneux in the replay yeah yeah no, it was unfortunate that year. Um, then John left, John Neil left, mm. um, and your former playing colleague, and as you say, someone you idolised as a kid, Bobby Murdoch took over, but it was in difficult circumstances, wasn't it, Tony? It, it, was, it was terrible because we actually became a selling club. I mm. mean, th that term, I don't think they used that term back in, in, in that time, but if you look at it now, historically, it, all these young players that came through the youth system, uh, got sold yeah. uh, and Bobby took on a job that was really starting to, to dip yeah. and uh, very difficult for him, did a fantastic job with the kids mm -hmm. but losing all those players as you said James was, yeah. was an impossible task. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you know in terms of, we said about that Wolves game, do you think that was a turning point in the club's history at that time, if we'd gone on and won that game? Do you think things would have been very different? Or was, was John Neil always going to go at the end of that season? Or? I, I, I think win, lose or draw, John shouldn't have gone right. after that game. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that was a huge, huge mistake mm -hmm. because the, the potential in that team was, was, was tremendous. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I, actually, I actually got fined 100 quid for saying that to the press. After the Wolves game? Yeah. After, yeah. <laughs> I mean, 100 quid then as well, Tony. I mean, fair bit of money. Yeah. You'll have been devastated about that, won't oh, you? Oh, I was as a Scotsman. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then we got relegated, end of 81-82. Um, and John Neal came in for you at Chelsea. Um, but they were a very different club then to the club they are now. What, what, was, what were things like at Chelsea? Uh, well, they didn't have any money. They were, they were in a really poor situation. Uh, and, and I think Ken Bates just managed to turn that run. But I, I didn't really want to leave the borough. Right. And I, I've never actually, I don't know if I've said this in public, uh, but I was offered a three-year deal, which then turned out to be a one-year deal, which right. I thought was a little bit poor. Yeah. <laughs> Not that it matters. I ended up going to Chelsea for less... And Millers were eventually offered me when they found out. So they came team. back with another they offer came for back you. With another offer, right? It, it it just it was too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I suppose then you'd been at the club for over ten years, mm -hmm. yeah. So they'd more they'd had more than the money's worth out of you, and you just feel as though. I, the, the thing is, and again, I'm not I'm not looking for sympathy. Mm -hmm. I, I I never argued over contracts. I always yeah, just yeah. signed contracts. This yeah. was the only time that I. I decided that no, I'm getting a little bit older now. I'll need to look after myself yeah. a little bit. So you go to Chelsea, um, and like we say, they're not the club that they are now, but still no. a big, big move to London. Um, were you happy to go down to London? Would that have been your first choice, or it was? It just came out of the blue. That was one, right. It just came out of the blue. I yeah. mean, I, I, if it not have been John, mm. I, I probably wouldn't have gone. Right. If I'm being honest. Yeah. But but what an experience. Yeah. It was just. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And you had two years there at Chelsea. Um, and I think, if I remember rightly, in your second year, you got promoted back up to the old first division. Yeah. And you actually came back to Weston Park and scored for Chelsea against the Borough. We did win 2-1, mind, but Tony, yeah, I mean, what sort of a reception did you get that day, coming back uh, in a Chelsea shirt? Uh, well, it, it, it wouldn't be any worse than I used to get when in I was playing for the Borough, yeah. <laughs> From, the, from the, those friendly guys in the chicken room. Oh, they were an understanding uh, bunch on there, yeah. weren't they? No, it was it was really strange coming back and playing against somebody that you'd played for for over ten years. Yeah, uh, and his score was again was weird, but I think I, I did something silly. I think I, I made a gesture to the director's box, right? Uh, which again was really silly. Yeah, I've um, got one of the questions here. Uh, another question coming in from John Ruddock. Did you play with David Curry? You know, I did play, play with David, David Curry. He used yeah. to be my roommate as well. All oh, right. Yeah. Any stories, Tony? 
Uh, no, After I nine o'clock, I, I, no. I won't mention his yeah. leather trousers. No. No, I a fashion uh, victim there, David Curry. Um, so yeah, Chelsea, you help them get promoted. Who was in that team? Who was in the squad then, Tony? What uh, sort of players are we talking about? Again, that was a really, really, really good squad. Pat Nevin, Joey Jones, uh, Kerry Dixon, uh, Clive Walker, Paul Carnival, uh, Mickey Droy, and then young lads like Colin Pates, Johnny Bumstead, yeah. Dale Jasper, Peter Rhodes Brown. It was just. I'm getting visions here. Viewers, if you're a bit too young to remember, I'm thinking here Mickey Troy, Joey Jones, yeah. and yourself. You've kind of conceded many goals that season with uh, you three lads playing there. It's been uh, a fearsome uh, set up that. It was, it was a big squad, and, and, yeah. and that was the beauty. I think they, they changed the team quite regularly, and yeah, yeah. because he had the players to do it. But yeah. it was, uh, it was, uh, it was different than, than, than playing for the Borough. Yeah. So he helped Chelsea get promoted, and then again, one of your old teammates is back in charge at the Borough, Willie Madrin. Um, and there was a deal set up involving Darren Wood and yourself. <laughs> How did all that come about, Tony? Uh, we were doing pre-season. I was running along the beach at Aberystwyth and John Neal says, oh, the chairman wants a word with you. And it was Ken Bates. And he says, oh, I want you to sign a new deal. So he offered me a four-year deal pre-season. And I says, well, can I wait to see if I'm in the team? Yeah. So long story short, season starts. I'm not in the team, so I went to see John and I said, listen, I, I won't sign the new deal. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sit in the reserves. I'll, I'll, I'll have a move on if you like. And then a couple of days later, he said, uh, how would you like to go back to the borough? Uh, we're trying to do a deal, exchange deal with, with Darren Wood. So yeah. again, that's how it came about. Yeah. But again, I came back here for <laughs> less than a for uh, Chelsea. I just wanted to play. Yeah, and again, the borough at that time, we're talking, what, 84? 84, 85 time. Yeah. Again, the club, it was probably darkest times, wasn't it? They I, were really I struggling. I wasn't really aware of how really bad it was. Right, it yeah. It was... Uh, Even in the two two years you'd been away, was there a massive difference from yeah. when you'd gone before? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah it, was, it, was, it was pretty pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. So we had the two years. And that, it must have been difficult because the gates were low then. Team was struggling. Um, I think first season we stayed up at Shrewsbury, wasn't it, the last day of the season? Yeah. And then the following year I went back there and we didn't stay up. Yeah. Uh, but again, like you said about Bobby Murdoch, Willie Madron had the job there under really difficult circumstances, didn't he? He, he was on a hiding in nothing, Willie. Yeah. Uh, expecting it to perform miracles with a, a poor squad, mm. if I've got to be totally honest. Uh, and again, it still sticks in my throat a little bit that my last game was getting relegated at Shrewsbury yeah, asking yeah. for the borough yeah. uh, but there you go it's football that is yeah uh, just look on some a bit there uh, on bit one cheerier. of your better days yeah a bit cheery William McCreighton's coming with a question what's the best game you ever played in your career Tony I should be able to remember that because there was only <laughs> one I think uh, it would probably have to be the well everybody would think the hat trick game but uh, I actually think that that game we stayed up at Shrewsbury away. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I think I played pretty well that day Did because we, cause we got we were done to ten men and yeah. we got we got a bit of a battering yeah. and we had to do quite a bit of defending. Yeah, yeah. Which was better for me playing away from yeah. home and, and being defended. Especially like at the time we were a team that you, we probably didn't win many games and no. not away from home to go away to Shrewsbury and win yeah. two 0 in a pressure situation like that. No, yeah. no that is good and. Um, so you've done over 350 games for the Borough. At the end of the 86 season, what did you do next? What happened next? Uh, I think as soon as when I left left the club, I uh, I started working for S and N Breweries. Yeah. And started playing non-league and Northern League. Uh, in in terms of your fitness and things like that, you, you suffered from injuries towards the end of your playing. Did you know towards the end of your time, like say when you were at the Borough in that second spell, did you know that? I can't do like full time anymore yeah, I, like, professionally. I, uh, as I mentioned before, we came, came on there. I, I was up for a year at Chelsea with a, a back operation, and I, I lost that real nasty streak that I, that I had. Yeah. And, and that that was part of my game. I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not stupid. I, I I know I know what I was, and I know how I played. And and but I'd lost that real streak. Yeah. And I was never the same. 
mm-hmm. never the same. I didn't feel the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so consequently, I uh, I decided that I'd, I'd, I should it'd be better that I uh, I tried to get Darlington and Hartlepool, but just I was being unfair to Darlington and Hartlepool yeah, by, yeah, yeah. by trying to keep playing. So yeah. I decided that I would uh, I would stop. Yeah. So you had a bit of time out the game, um, and then you've got back into the game. You've almost had like a second career, which has gone on more than your playing career in coaching. Yeah. Uh, you've been involved, like you say, Hartlepool, Darlington, Stoke, Leicester, Villa. Um, I mean, what's been your highlights there in your coaching career? So it's uh, been quite a long career in coaching, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's being a development coach. It, it, I didn't know I. I I had any, I had no inclinations about being a coach. It was when I was at Darlington, I was working for the PFA. Brian Little got the manager's job, asked me if I would become youth team coach, uh, which was a no-brainer. Yeah. So I did, and then I went to Lily Shaw, got me, started on me, me coaching badges, and then it, it went from there. Brian went to Leicester. I eventually followed up to Leicester, and then he went to Villa, and then. I went to Villa, then we went to Stoke, and then I went back to Villa. So, over the years, uh, I, I got into coaching in a, in, a, in a big, big way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And but as a development coach, seeing young players that you've worked with from an early age, getting into that first team is just yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. It's a great feeling. Because yeah. it's like, it's your job, and you, you, like you say, when you're playing as a player, Yes, you want to do well with the team, but you sort of just have to take care of yourself. But when you are a coach, especially a youth team coach, um, is the pressure on you there to get results or is it to bring players through for the first team? Do you get more pleasure out of actually players making a career in the game or actually, say, achieving it? Because did you win a youth cup with Villa? I was fortunate enough we won the youth cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we also lost three finals. Yeah, one of them might be against the Borough, I think so. Yeah, yeah, one of them was against the Borough, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you must take immense pride in all these young lads that have gone on to have career. I mean, just throw a few of the names out there of players that have... I, I, I just need to say, I, I, I'd be quite arrogant to think that was done to me. Mm. It was a it was a team effort. Yeah, yeah. And all academies are team efforts. Yeah. And there's a lot of people in that team. I was fortunate that I was just one of the members of that team. Yeah. But, I think for me the best player that, that that was produced from that group of players at Villa was Gareth Barry. Yeah. Was I mean he was just absolute genius. Gabby Agbon Lahore is, yeah. as well. I mean Gabby's although Gabby's not brought loads of money into the club, he's he's played for that club since he was ten. Yeah, yeah. Which which is phenomenal. Yeah, great so career. Yeah. It's 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 great. Lee Hendry, a little bit earlier, but again another one. Uh, Gary Cahill, yeah, a good player. Mark Albrighton, yeah. There's there's been quite a few established Premier League players, lads that have had really good long careers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. excellent. Yeah. Um, Simon Barber's got a question here for us. What was your favourite team, or and your favourite teammate at the Borough, um, and what was the best team that you played as part of? Difficult question that. So you've got the two spells. I guess it'd be obviously in the first spell. Uh, well, I used to knock about with, uh, with, with Jimmy Stewart, goalkeeper. Right. Uh, later on, my second spell, it would be Gary Gill. I've always been close with Proc mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and Hodgie. Yeah. Uh, well, I say close, Proc never phones you back. <laughs> uh, so it's a reverse charges job, is it? Oh, well. <laughs> no, he just doesn't <laughs> phone, phone you. Back. He just doesn't <laughs> phone you. Uh, what was the second part? Um, and what was like the best team? That you played in, that I played in, yeah. Oh, it would. I mean, I only played one game. It would have to be the the seventy three, seventy four team. Yeah, yeah. But I think John Neal's team were, if they'd have stayed together, that had could real have really achieved things. Yeah, real possibilities. Yeah, good stuff. Um, Lee Bailey coming with a question here. Lee, what player has went on to have the best career that Tony has helped? Well, obviously mentioned there about Gareth, Gareth Barry. Yeah. Um, cause, I mean, he's played for England, hasn't he, as well? And he's got the record Premier League Premier, appearances. Yeah, yeah no. But he's a, the, the first... He actually came in with a, with, with a guy called Mikey Standing, and Michael was the, the, was the one that we were looking to sign. Right. <laughs> but they decided to bring Gareth in with him. And the, after the first training session, we went to the... Me and the other coach went to the academy manager and said, don't bother about him. <laughs> That's the one you want. Uh, so that was 
But Gareth was always going to be the top player. Yeah, yeah. Even at the age of 15. Quite apparent, yeah. Yeah. Um, 45 years, then in total, you've been involved in football, Tony. In your opinion, has the game changed? Well, it's obviously changed. Better, worse, some things good, some things bad. What do you, what do you think? Uh, it's, it's certainly not the same. It's mm. certainly not the same. I, I'm not going to, I wouldn't, I don't think I, you should compare it mm. because there's, there's, there's no comparison. It's just different. Yeah, yeah. It's just different. Everything's different. The equipment's different. Boots are different. Pitches are different. Mm. Uh, I'd like this, and it, I don't want people to think this is because I, I, how I, I just think that the contact's getting taken at the game too much. Yeah, And definitely. I'm not talking about people kicking people and, and silly freak. I'm talking about actual physical contact. Mm -hmm. the, the least touching of people are just hitting the deck. There's too many stoppages yeah. because of this and the game's becoming bitty and it's not a spectacle where people can go and get excited yeah. about. Well, I think I remember going to watch games and you'd often get as big a cheer, not as, as much a cheer as a goal, but you get big cheers when someone had absolutely wallop someone with a great tackle and get the, yeah. it, gets the, it gets everybody going in the ground and it would sometimes inspire the rest of the team and get everybody wound up and that, like you say, it seems to have gone from the game now, that. It's, it's as if you, you, you're asking people to defend without tackling it and you're decrying defending, really, because mm. defending is a skill. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Defending is a skill. Yeah. Um, are you pleased, and you, you played in the era that you did, so like in the 70s and 80s, were you? Or I, if, you, if you could change it, would you like to play in the modern I, I have absolutely no regrets about my career. Mm. I... Uh, I've made loads of mistakes. I've done some things that have been quite good, uh, but I don't have any regrets, and I wouldn't change anything because I wouldn't be where I am now. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and, I, and I'm in quite a good place. I've had a reasonable career. I've, I've had a decent career as a coach. Yeah. Uh, and I owe everything really to to the Borough for for giving me the, the first opportunity. Mm. Yeah, great. Um, I've just. Thought of a question here, just the last few weeks there's been players mentioned about coming in, we've had a transfer window, um, and there was a player mentioned who plays for Hibs in Scotland called John McGinn. Now there's been people mentioning about, oh we don't want John McGinn, um, we've bought players from Scotland before and it hasn't worked out, things like that. Now in the past, there was a lot of outstanding players have come from Scotland, um, 70s, 80s, 90s. Do you think it's just a thing that's maybe because Borough fans maybe got their fingers burned a little bit with some of the players Gordon Strachan might have brought in. I think there is talented players up there in Scotland. Do you think there's still the talented players up there that could come and do a job in the Championship down here? Hard to say, not having seen a lot of Scottish football. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, why think, do, you, why do you think there's a change from... Like in the 70s, 80s, 90s, there was lots of players came down south, really good. And we're talking outstanding players like Dalgleish, Sunas. You're talking world-class players. Yeah, yeah. And then there was players that didn't even come down south, the likes of Paul McStay, Davy Cooper, absolutely outstanding footballers. But again, that's, that's why Scotland are struggling to qualify for championships. Mm. Because in the past, we've always had a, at least one world-class player yeah. in that team. Mm -hmm. Now, who's, who's your world-class Scottish player? Yeah. Yeah. So the, I think the game up there is in a little bit of a bit of a doldrum. Yeah. So that's it. Uh, but you can't say that we should never take any Scottish players. No. Yeah. Because anyone you could just, be a good player. Yeah. There will be somebody up there who is. Yeah. A gem. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, Tony, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show tonight, sharing your memories of your time in football and at the Borough. Uh, Borough fans, thanks for joining us. Remember to keep up to date with all the latest goings on at the club through Borough Fan TV. Until next week, red and white, you and me, Monday at 6, Borough Fan TV, up the borough.